Okay, uh, good morning, good evening, good everywhere, and uh, uh, welcome to this uh, uh, second day of the talk. And uh, today is the, uh, I mean, we talk about uh, one of the hottest topics recently on refrigerable intelligence service for 6G communication, sensing, and the localization. And uh, we have the three hour tutorial presentation for ICCC, which you can find on this five side. And uh, also, we acknowledge. Uh, the collaborator from Beijing University, uh, Professor Lin Yangsong, Professor Boya uh, Di, uh, Dr. Boya Di, Dr. Hong Liang Zhang, and uh, Jin Zhu Hu, Hao, Hao Bo Zheng, Shu Hao Zeng, uh, and also Dr. Uh, Xue Li Chao, and uh, uh, Ms. Chen Ya Li. Okay. And uh, the objective is uh, first we have the basic introduction about RIS and uh, uh, why this one is a very hot topic recently. And then we are talk concentrated on this communication and the Internet of Things. And then, okay, we learn how to, I mean, the, uh, because I'm, I'm a resource allocation guy. So let's talk about something about this kind of mathematical tool related. So we can we talk about the optimization and the machine learning. Just some basic, even though I know many of you already know them already, but allow me to use maybe 30, 40 minutes to introduce it. And finally, we know we try to understand how to optimize the RIS aided network. So for communication, we try to think about the beamforming and the deployment. For sensing, we try to uh, active uh, design multiple paths and also the localization. And uh, I think. Uh, this one, okay, a lot of, uh, we, uh, for localization, we have a real hardware implementation, and uh, let's see what we can do. And uh, uh, again, okay, uh, as you, most of you know, that uh, I'm the re uh, networking resource allocation guy. I'm not quite a physical layer guy or this uh, hardware implementation guy. So from this talk, okay, uh, we concentrate on the basic of uh, RIS, what is the uh, uh, meaning for that, and uh, how, how, what is the basic kind of physical meaning for that? And also how to use RIS for networking problem. So we are not to, doing this kind of performance analysis, uh, like the signal processing information theory guy. And also I'm not a CPS people. I'm not, I'm not this CPS people to um, implement thing. So we just uh, use a uh, commercial on the shelf to implement our, our, our task. So I mean, we, this is our concentration. But on the other hand, okay, you can find many kind of YouTube video, and uh, especially, uh, for example, from this uh, Erica Larson and uh, from the other people, they have uh, some kind of hardware and also a uh, physical layer part. So we concentrate on the different uh, aspect. So here is a table of content. First, we talk about the IRS physics, and then the second part is about this uh, review of the optimization and the machine learning. And it's uh, very boring for some of you who is already expert, but allow me to introduce here. And then after that, okay, we will talk about the uh, uh, RS uh, aided the cellular communication. So with the uh, RS aided, what we can do to improve this kind of uh, cellular performance resource allocation. And uh, this is the third part, and the last part is the RS aided kind of internet thing. We have the uh, RS sensing and indoor localization hardware implementation, and try to show show you some kind of uh, our result. So this is a we will break after the uh, mathematical tools, and uh, for fifteen minutes, and then we continue. So. Uh, for, for mobile, okay, I mean, it's come from the text to voice and to data and to everything. And in 5G and 2G, the first wave, uh, this uh, big, big phone to this kind of IPL phone. And uh, this is uh, for the mobile. And for 3G, 4G, uh, ever after iPhone come out, and then it's a multimedia. And in 5G, okay, it has this kind of uh, everything, new business model, like the social issue, human-centered value creation, and so on. And uh, for Internet of Things, okay, they have the mobile devices. Now, uh, nowadays, if you go to uh, go, go, go China, okay, go to China, there's no cash at all. Okay, everybody use a phone to cash, uh, to, to, uh, to pay. So basically, okay, uh, it will kind of very convenient. There's no, no robbery, no thief there because uh, nothing, nothing to steal, okay. And uh, for Internet of Things, they connected uh, all type of sensor everywhere. 
and uh, they will have a billions of zillions of sensor, which can create need an integrated network, and then will become a, a smart planet. Okay. And uh, to implement such a thing, cell phone system is very important for 5G. Okay, 5G. Uh, they have a uh, uh, three important topic. The capacity enhancement, especially at the edge, the solution is EMDB. And uh, there are a lot of internet of things, massive connectivity, the solution is MMTC. And also for some applications such like a self-driving car or gaming, they use a, a ultra reliable a low latency requirement. So this is a three, three major topic, three pillar for 5G communication. And enabled by 5G, there are many different uh, um, new applications. For example, AR, VR, and uh, UAV, industrial uh, 4.0, auto, uh, autonomous driving, and smart coordination, etc. And when it comes to 6G, compared to 5G, we need a higher data rate, larger coverage. And this is very important because for 5G communication, in order to achieve this very high data rate, they will have a very small cell. So for 5G, uh, 5G, um, the cell size is very small, but uh, okay, uh, we need, we, on the other hand, we also need the higher co coverage. So yesterday we talked about uh, this uh, error access network with satellite, and uh, those things can increase the uh, coverage. And the low power consumption and the 5G, uh, just one week ago there's a news that 5G cost uh, energy consumption is huge. And also we need a smarter devices. And here is a, a diagram that's okay for 6G compared with 5G, they will have the uh, rate, battery, and uh, cell coverage, uh, resolution position, and energy efficiency. So basically this is a block diagram. And uh, there are some kind of dilemma in the current technology. So there's con con uh, conflict between the low, low hardware cost and the high spectral res uh, spatial resolution. So in order to have the high spatial resolution, then you need a lot of hardware, just as I mentioned. For 5G, you need to have a lot of small base station. It costs a lot. And uh, the solution is uh, you can have a higher frequency communication, like millimeter wave, or massive MIMO, massive MIMO, and a lot of antenna, or ultra-dense network. And those are the probably, uh, before the RIS, is uh, the three major important problem uh, for this kind of uh, uh, physical layer. But the ultra-dense network is not in physical layer. Massive memo and uh, millimeter wave is an important topic during the last few years. And uh, the second conflict is, a uh, second dilemma is that the conflict between the flight network deployment and the low energy consumption. So uh, we have this kind of a fixed point, and then we can have this moving access point, and uh, like UAV that we discussed yesterday, and uh, then this is a kind of a, a two different scenario. And the RIS is a very uh, promising solution. And uh, because on the new technology, we want to low cost, high spatial resolution, easy to deploy, and uh, compatible with CT demand on communication and sensing. And the RIS is uh, very easy to deploy. It's just a kind of war, okay? Between the, you can deploy between this transmitter and the receiver. And the reflective wave in, desired uh, direction without extra hardware for communication, and it responds fast uh, in change of propagation environment for sensing, so it's good. So for communication RIS, you can consider this one like a kind of reflector. So sometimes, okay, when you take a, a, take a photo, you need a reflector. For example, now I have the light in this way, my, uh, my chin is dark. So if you have some kind of reflector here, and then I will look much better. And sometimes when you have this um, a photographer next to, next to the model, there are some kind of, some, somebody to hold the reflector so that the chin will look better. So basically you can consider RS as this kind of, uh, I mean, a reflector, okay. So what is RS? RS is an ultra thin meta surface. And for the outer layer, okay, hold on a second. For the outer layer, they have a, a by electrical subsurface of this RS element, and uh, it's directly interact with the incident uh, signal. So basically, this is like a, um, it's like a backscatter, backscattering. So basically, it can on and off to reflect or not reflect. And then you have middle layer for this copper to 
who prevent it from this kind of uh, penetrate and then have an inner, inner layer for control circuit board. And the RS component uh, responds to several pins, several directions with on and off. And when you combine this on and off together, reflection on and off, you can, you can move this kind of uh, uh, this beam towards a different direction. Okay, and the working frequency can be from sub 60 to gigahertz. And the RS history, and uh, in this uh, 1960, this uh, uh, Victor produced the material with a negative reflection index. Okay, 2000, uh, there are super lens capture the image below the diffraction limit. And 2006, inv invisible code. And 2011, general uh, law of reflection, ref uh, refraction and re reflection was developed together with uh, uh, meta, meta material. And 2014, program material was proposed by real time control. Real time control. Okay. So you can see it's a relatively new kind of technology. During the last five years, this becomes a reality. And uh, why we needed RS? First, it's a very cheap. Okay. I mean, if you, if you can manufacture the, I mean, uh, manufacture. RS is a passive. So uh, they, this is just a, just a reflector. When you think about it with how much is reflected, and it does not processing. So there's no AD, ADC or DAC. And the ADC is very expensive. Yeah, so that's that, that's reason. And also the front end RF is also kind of expensive. So that's reason it's very low cost. And also it has a higher resolution. RS integrates a large number of antenna element into a compact space in form of spatial continuous electromagnetic aperture. So basically you have a lot of antenna. If you have a lot of antenna into a small space, and then, okay, you can beam this one to, to the direction very accurately. So in this case, okay, just like your aperture is very, very, uh, very good. So make it very good to, to the beam to any direction. And very easy to implement. And the thin surface can make them flexible to deploy to extent and compatible with other existing technology. It's just put outside the building or inside the building on the wall, and then it's just reflect. So here is the comparison. For RIS, it's a passive, and it's a full duplex, and the number of uh, and the transmit chain is needed is zero because there's no kind of, uh, uh, it's directly reflected out. And the hardware cost is low, and the energy consumption is low. For mesh and memo and relay, you need an ADC. You need an ADC, and then after that, okay, you do the uh, signal processing and then transmit it out. So the cost is very high, and uh, I mean energy consumption is high. So the different, uh, you know, last time I gave the talk, somebody asked me, okay, what's the difference between RIS and uh, backscattering? They 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 have very similar, I mean, kind of. Uh, uh, RIS needs some kind of backscatter technology to, to on and off, but the backscatter is a parasite. Why is a parasite? Because it's use the other signal to on and off to transmit its own signal so that receiver can, can receive it. So basically, okay, backscatter use the other, it doesn't help the other. It's just try to, I mean, uh, on top of the other signal to transmit its own signal. However, for RIS, it's helping the other signal. So basically, I'm helping, helping the, the, the photographer to, to change the light, such as the model, model or the receiver looks better, or the signal to noise ratio is higher. So that's a major difference. And also, RIS have many, many kind of, uh, I mean, uh, backscatter this on and off component so that it can tear this kind of beam, beam forming into the direct, uh, into the desired direction. So this is a major difference. And uh, then there are many kind of prototype and uh, due to our limitation, I'm sure that okay, there are many other type of prototype. I just give two examples. And then you Google it, you can find many, many different ones. And then uh, we have the NTT Docomo MetaWay. We send the 5G coverage indoor and outdoor. And then they have a 10 times increase in communication speed. And uh, also they can improve the dead zone, corner, by hall, or something like that. And uh, for Duke, they have this, uh, 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 it's called Green Wave. They can uh, detect and analyze the motion, capture the temporary variation of motion and the descent information. So basically this is for sensing, sensing purpose. 
So the previous is for communication, this is for sensing purpose. There are many different types, okay. And uh, then the transmission process, he said, okay, the EM wave impinge on the RS surface inducting current. The RS refraction signal towards the user. So you see, if the regular surface is just bounced by with the same angle, with the same angle, for example, to the user one. However, if by using the RS for the control circuit, they, they change the impedance here, so that, okay, uh, the, so the beam, instead of bounce back to user two, it can bounce back to user two or user k. So by doing this one, they can, they, uh, they can kind of uh, changing, electrically changing the direction of the reflection without changing, physically changing the surface. So that is a good thing for that, okay. And then by they changing the direction by changing the phase and amplitude. Okay, so here is a reflection signal and uh, this uh, gamma is a reflection amplitude. They can have a zero and a one, between zero and a one. And the theta is the, the phase shift. That is a kind of a response from the uh, different direction. And then it can control the P by PN uh, diode. And then uh, because you have a limitation, I mean, some, each diode is on and off. So when they combine them together, they can change to a different direction. But uh, okay, uh, because you have limited P, uh, PN node, diode, so basically, your, your, your kind of phase shift is discrete. So in other words, it's not continuous. But in the later, we will show you that, okay, just a few bit, I mean, three bit maybe, okay, is sufficient enough. Later, we, we have some paper to show you that, okay, how many kind of uh, uh, PN node is necessary. And uh, so basically, okay, here, if you have a K PN node, you will have a two to the K, power of K phase shift, yeah. And uh, the, the channel model is a, a typically rising model. So the user to RS to base station act as a dominant line of sight component. So basically, okay, you will have a, a signal, signal, hello? Okay. You will have the signal transmitted and then you will have a line of sight and a non line of sight. And then it will be product of the signal from here to, uh, which related a large, large, large scale propagation from here to, uh, from the base station to the RS and uh, then uh, from the RS to the user. So you need to uh, multiply it together. And then you have the reflection coefficient, gamma is a constant, this is, this is a phase shift, phase change, this is a channel gain, X and X is a transmission signal plus a noise. And then in matrix form, okay, we can use this uh, Q as a spatial, spatial channel between the base station and uh, this kind of RS. And uh, uh, F is the RS response, and the Q is uh, this uh, spatial from the user to RS. So overall, you can represent it in this way, in this matrix form. So you see this form is also look like uh, this, uh, this uh, backscatter, backscatter. You have two channel condition, okay, two channels. And the uh, application, okay, you can have the spectral efficient enhancement as the Docomo has done, coverage intention, yeah. Sometimes, okay, I ask my postdoc to be online just in case my, my signal is not good, I'm offline, and uh, he will continue to give you guys presentation. Also, yeah, I just make him the co-host just in case, okay. And uh, energy efficient improvement, and obviously because uh, you have this uh, kind of reflection, your signal to noise ratio enhanced. So in this case, your signal to noise ratio increased. And also you can use the sensing and the localization. So basically any of movement will change, will make these signal changes. And the receive can infer such kind of changes based on the receive signal. And the RS can point to the user, follow you. And so that okay, and uh, I mean, basically okay, uh, tell the difference. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi kind of a company, and uh, uh, they can use the Wi-Fi to detect, uh, okay, the people's movement, and uh, for these uh, senior people uh, falling, or for this uh, kind of uh, uh, home security. And uh, with RIS, you can also uh, further improve it. Yeah, because of Wi-Fi, okay, first you have a lot of interference, second, the wavelength is maybe too long, uh, too long. but for RIS, it will be uh, probably better, okay. 
And later we will show you some kind of a, a result on this kind of using the hardware to, to do the uh, localization and the position estimation. Anyway, so this is the basic uh, uh, basics for the RIS. And the most important thing is about the channel. Okay, when you write the RIS channel, try to make sure that okay, your channel, channel model is written in a, in a correct way. And, uh, but for how to implement and also the physical, the detailed physical layer part, you can check from the other YouTube uh, link and uh, for your reference. And uh, in the next uh, maybe uh, 30 minutes, and I will quickly go through this kind of uh, uh, mathematical tools and uh, for optimization and uh, machine learning. And uh, for optimization, okay, I just shrink uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, Stephen Boy in Stanford, I mean, talk to a very few slides, but uh, the most important part. And for machine learning, you definitely can see much, many, many different uh, uh, kind of uh, video online, which will teach much better than me. Okay, for example, Andrew Wing, and uh, his, his lecture is wonderful. But here, I just try to summarize. Okay, and um, yeah, try to, so anyway, yeah, let's go through it. And um, here is the uh, two websites that you can, you can go and I have 40 hours of uh, slides here. And uh, for teacher, okay, feel free to, uh, to use them if you like, they are not too bad. And uh, anyway, I think uh, just for your information. Okay, so let's talk about some basic about the optimization. And uh, we talk about uh, the convex site uh, and also how to, what is the convex optimization? What is the kind of algorithm? and also, okay, uh, some optimality condition. So what is this kind of convex set? So when you do an optimization problem, your variable have a feasible set, and this feasible set can be convex or non-convex. So what is the convex? Suppose you have a X and a Y within the feasible set or within the set, and when you link the line together, everything in the middle within this set. If this case for all the X and the Y, you will have the convex set. Uh, on the other hand, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hello? Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, okay, sorry for that. And uh, I have uh, some thunderstorm here, okay, so sorry, okay. I mean, Dr. John, okay, just in case I'm offline, you continue. <laughs> okay, anyway, and uh, then, okay, uh, So in this, in the right case, okay, you can see that in the middle is outside and outside the feasible side. So in this case, your feasible side is not, not convex. And then after your feasible side, what is your objective function? If your objective function is a convex function, then this will have the good perform, uh, kind of a, have many good properties. But what is the convex function? So this is your function. You have two points here, and then you link them together and this line will above the function. So this is called convex function. Okay, so basically it's look like this one. And the uh, concave function is vice versa. Okay, vice versa. So if you're, for convex optimization, if your objective function is a convex or concave, and your constraint uh, feasible set is also a convex set, then in this case, it's called a, a kind of a convex optimization. With a convex optimization, the nice thing is that, okay, there's, a local, there's no local optimal. There's only one optimal point, which is a global optimal. So it's a, which, which is a very nice kind of a property. And uh, typically, okay, uh, in practice, okay, for big data, uh, typically the problem is a convex. For some kind of practical real thing, especially for value communication, your channel capacity is not convex. So in this case, it's not convex. So what you can do? What you can do is that, okay, you can use some kind of algorithm to, uh, to uh, infer the non-convex one to convex one. 
and then you solve this one intuitively, like the DC algorithm and so on. But this is more advanced, but, but uh, anyway, here I just want to mention it. And then after the problem formulation, we know that, okay, that uh, uh, the, the, for complex optimization, uh, we can find the global optimal. But how could we find it? And uh, let me go back again. Again, typically you cannot get closed form solution. You have to do the iterative. So basically, what you do is that you're starting from one point, you drop a ball, and this ball will falling down, falling down until to the bottom. Okay. So and when it comes to the bottom, you know that okay. When it stop moving, you know that okay. It is a uh, stop moving because the gradient is equal to zero, and then okay, you know that is a global optimal. So. That is the reason we need some kind of a utility algorithm to find the solution, uh, because we cannot get a closed form solution for that. And this is a gradient descendant. So what is a gradient descendant? So suppose starting point is x. If I found this x, the starting point, the gradient is zero, that means I'm on the bottom. Then in this case, I'm done. Otherwise, I'm going to the direction uh, with a step size of alpha, and uh, this direction, this, uh, 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 I'm going to the direction and uh, this direction and the gradient because the gradient is uphill and I'm doing minimize. I'm going to the direction that, uh, I mean, inner product of the gradient will be negative. That means I'm going downhill. As long as I'm going downhill, I'm the step size of alpha, I'm toward the downhill with the step size of alpha and the direction is D. And then I try to move from X to X plus uh, alpha D. So in this case, I'm going downhill until to the point that uh, my gradient equals to zero. So this is a gradient descendant method. And uh, then th this is a general case, as long as the di distance is a, a direction is going downhill, we have special case. The one case is that, okay, steep is descendant method. So I'm going to the deep, the direction of the steep is descendant. And the second thing is a, a Newton method, basically using the Hamilton. So basically using the second order differentiation, try to kind of uh, improve this uh, convergence. So for the store, uh, gradient, gradient descendant, you can consider that, okay, you are falling down off the stair. So this is the fastest way to going down. But in, uh, in reality, the, the convergence is very slow for such kind of thing. For example, you, if you see a lot of machine learning algorithm, and uh, they, they, they are not, they are using the stochastic gradient descendant method, but they never use the steepest descendant gradient method because the convergence is very slow. Why? Because this is a contour. Okay, we are going down, down, this is a uh, basin. And then uh, uh, this, from here, I the steepest descendant in this direction. And then I go this direction because I have a step size. So instead of going this direction, I will go to this direction on the step side, and then, at this point, I go to this direction and step. It's and the, I go this zigzag, zigzag until very slowly to, toward this direction. So this will cause this kind of a steep, due to my step size is not kind of a finite, uh, it's not a small. So in this case, okay, we'll make my convergence very slow. So that's the reason, okay. In, uh, in reality, in practice, uh, we seldom use steep, steep descendant for, uh, method. And sometimes you use the Newton method. Basically, you can consider my original function as a, the function value at the initial point. This is the first order gradient. This is second order. So by using the second order, we have this kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, I mean, much faster convergence. So this is a good thing. The convergence is much quicker. But the bad thing is that, OK, you need the second order differentiation. The, the complexity is high. And sometimes, OK, it's not quite stable not like a gradient descendant is very stable. So, okay, so the previous two problem, Newton or this gradient descendant method is for unconstrained optimization. So starting from any point, I'm trying to converge to the optimal point. But how about you have constraint? Constraint, then what do you do? So here we try to use the Lagrange multiplier. And for Lagrange multiplier, this is a, suppose this is a, uh, this is, a, uh, this is a convex optimization problem. And what you do is that, okay, you change the original constraint problem into unconstrained problem by introducing Lagrange multiplier, lambda, and gamma. And then, okay, 
in the large domain dual problem, instead of optimize x, you optimize lambda and v. So in this case, the dual problem becomes an unconstrained problem. And then, okay, and um, then, okay, if your original problem is a convex, then your dual problem and the original problem have the same solution, have the same solution. Well, this kind of uh, a dual problem is unconstrained. And um, however, even though your original problem is an unconstrained, the prime problem, this is the original prime problem, is unconvex. By using the Nagelaron dual problem, this dual problem is always convex. So, and also provide a lower bound for this uh, kind of original solution. So this is basically, okay, intuitive for this uh, original prime dual problem, intuitive. And then original problem is not convex, but I use dual problem to provide a lower bound to find a solution, and then I come back to the prime problem again. And uh, also this is duality. The so-called duality is that, okay, suppose this, uh, I mean, convex optimization, then I found the dual problem is equal to this kind of uh, original problem. Otherwise, you serve as a lower bound for this. So this is the case. And uh, finally, we talk about this uh, stopping criteria. For such kind of, uh, I mean, for such kind of constraint compensation, when should I stop? And then, okay, uh, if unconstrained, there's no constraint, then the gradient equal to zero is a stopping point. However, if it is constrained, then what do you need to do? So this is a KKD condition by three uh, mathematician, and uh, this is a kind of a condition in mathematical way. But uh, in plain English, basically means that, okay, I put a ball and, uh, over this curve and then trying to fall in down. Either it is uh, on the bottom of the valley, so the gradient equal zero, or it hit the boundary. Uh, this is a function and this is a boundary, this is a feasible side boundary, and then at here, my ball cannot go down, going down more, because when it's going down more, it will out of, outside of the feedable side. So in this case, okay, I just stop there. So basically, this is in plain English what you do, but in this is in mathematics what what it uh, means for this. Okay, and uh, another choice to make this uh, constraint optimization into the unconstrained optimization is by adding this uh, kind of uh, I mean barrier function. The so-called barrier function is look like, for example, log log function, log function, with a different value of t, it will approximate this kind of barrier. So our ideal barrier is that, okay, when <coughs> mu is less than zero, it should be zero, otherwise it should be infinity. So basically prevent the, your mu from, uh, prevent your signal from going from the feasible side to the unfeasible side. But what you can do is that, okay, you can, you can have this, uh, I mean, viral function at the beginning is uh, very smooth, and then, okay, you try to prevent it from invisible, and then with a time increase, with an iteration by iteration, this t increase so that, okay, it become more and more ideal feasible side, and uh, finally, okay, it will convert to the solution. And why you want to do this one? Because we want to have the interior, uh, interior point method. Starting from any point, we want to find this uh, solution, and uh, if you don't put the interior point, it will come to the boundary and then will move very, very, very slow to the direction. It take a, uh, take a long, many, many iteration. But by using the interior point method, it push your, your signal inside the feasible side. So you will have a gradient. So it will convert to the optimal point very quick. So that's the reason for the interior point method, okay. Anyway, so very quick, this is just a basic. And uh, then the next one, we try to uh, try to have this, uh, have the machine learning one. And uh, so we talk about the classical machine learning, deep learning, and the reinforcement learning. So, uh, you know, uh, now my former PhD student went to Apple, and he, he, his work is regarding this, uh, I mean, how to reduce this kind of uh, energy, energy consumption for Wi-Fi searching. So uh, his paper was written by some uh, Apple engineer and uh, uh, asked him to have an interview. And everything is good until to the last point. Okay, there's a senior engineer asking about some uh, basic for this uh, classic machine learning. And uh, he didn't answer in a good way. So in other words, okay, even though, okay, nowadays this kind of uh, high technology like deep learning or something is very popular, good for your research, but to pay attention that, okay, majority of the company is still using the classical one. 
So your basic coursework should be uh, very solid. Okay, here I just want to remind you what is the basic for machine learning. Okay, machine learning, they have two types, three types, as a matter of fact. Uh, supervised learning, so you get the data and then you label. This is an apple, this is a banana. And then after that, you have a cut. And then in the middle, so in the future, if you sample on this side is apple, on this side is a banana. So the key question is that, okay, where should I have the cut? And then the classical algorithm is a SVM. And then for unsupervised learning, you collect the data, you have no kind of a label. For example, we work for the local, uh, local I mean, uh, power company, they have the smart meter data. And after collect the smart meter data, they ask us a question, how many type of customer behavior that we have? And then in this case, we have no, no label. We have to use this uh, clustering to see how many cluster, uh, unsupervised learning to see how, how many cluster I have. So in this case, it's called, uh, I mean, unsupervised learning. The Bible kind of algorithm is called K-mean. And uh, for SVM, supervised learning, we are trying to get this kind of a cut here, such that after this cut, this boundary is the largest one. And then this, uh, this cut will be represented by the uh, W and B, basically this uh, uh, angle and this movement. So this one can be efficiently calculated by the complex optimization we mentioned before. So that's the reason SVM is, uh, I mean, SVM is this kind of benchmark solution for this uh, supervised learning. And uh, then there are many different applications and uh, I, I can just uh, skip it. And for unsupervised learning, so you see those data without any kind of label. And then the viable solution is the k-mean. Suppose we, we know how many type of cluster you have, k equal to five in this case. If you don't know, you can check my website to see my PhD student work that uh, interviewed with Apple for this non-basic parametric learning to learn what is the k is. But so here, okay, for k-mean, you're supposed to know the k. Suppose we know the high five cluster, we randomly select the, this kind of a five initial point. And after that, you have the cut in the middle, cut in the middle. And then within this region, this is, this is the cut between these two points in the middle, and this is cut between these two points. And within this region, you're moving from this point to the weighted center, weighted center. And then after that, you have this green point. And after the green point, you do the cut again, and then you do the weighted center again, which is called E, e step and M step, EM algorithm. And after that, it will convert to some solution. So this is a classical solution for this Kenyan method. And then they have a different application, and uh, so basically it's for unsupervised. And uh, there are many different algorithms. And for classical algorithm method, like uh, SVM, Kenyan, or random forest, they do not have a lot of data. The training, da uh, training data have a category feature, and uh, also the result is very explainable and a very high data rate. And nowadays, okay, it sounds like, at least in academic, the deep learning is very hot. In industry, only the big company. Okay. A lot of training data have the same related domain and they improve the domain adaptation. Very slow, but the performance is very good. And, uh, but on the other hand, it's really no, cannot, you cannot explain what the results look like. I mean, what, why the result work? So that is a kind of a, a drawback for deep learning because it looks like a black box. So that's the reason, okay, recently in this uh, uh, nor, uh, North American, uh, for AI development, they have the explainable AI or this fairness AI. Yeah, because sometimes AI can, can cause unfairness. So this is a very hot topic. And for international I mean, scholar, okay, you can consider this direction, okay, for machine learning. But, let, but let's talk about the basic because there are so many students here as well. And, uh, and then, okay, we have the, this is a deep neural network uh, basic. We have the input and the add the weighted function plus this kind of, uh, I mean, uh, constant. And this I function is a nonlinear function. And it typically it's a great loop, okay. And then combine them together for multiple layer, and then you can you can approximate any kind of nonlinear function. So in other words, for supervised learning, for SVM, the problem is a linear cut. 
How about your cart is kind of, uh, I mean, very, very nonlinear. So in this case, you can use this kind of uh, deep learning, multiple layer, multiple kind of uh, uh, nonlinear non function, because I is nonlinear function, multiple concatenated together, it will have that function. I can uh, any function for that. So that is nice thing. And another nice thing is that, okay, because you have this uh, linear inside, so if you have an arrow, you can use a, uh, you can use a, I mean, back propagation to propagate the arrow to update this W in a very efficient way. So in this case, in this case, it's take advantage of both nonlinear and non and the linear. So that reason is very popular. And uh, the deep learning, all those algorithms is developed in early late 1980s and early 1990s. Only after almost 30 years. I mean, 25 years, okay, it's become to, I mean, popular again. The reason is calculation, GPU. And uh, in 2014, the GPU kind of, uh, I mean, uh, become reality. So basically, okay, the deep learning becomes so hard. So for deep, deep learning, typically you have three types, CNN, RNN, and uh, deep belief network. So CNN is a work for this image. And it takes the image, you use a convolutional kernel to conv convolute, and then you do the rectifier, I mean, reclu, and then you do the spooling, basically, uh, stop sampling it, and then get feature. And then you concatenate them together, so it very, will be very efficient for image processing. For RNN, so basically, okay, for over the different time, CNN is for image, RNN is for voice and natural language, writing, something like that, because you have the time. Over the different time, they have the reaction, and uh, they, they have the cause and the, the uh, consequent. So basically, you use this RNN to, to formulate. And for RNN, traditional RNN have the problem of short memory. So if you have uh, this, uh, the, the, for RNN, the tip, the Bible algorithm is RSTM. So basically, you have a, a, a diary, so to write down. Okay, so basically, this is a, this is a idea for that. And then, okay, you have a very general one for this uh, uh, restri restricted Boltzmann machine. So basically, this is restricted Boltzmann machine. You can cut it together. And here is the comparison. For CNN and the deep belief network, they all have the multiple layer. They use a back propagation algorithm for training and they have created a very powerful tool. But differently is that okay, CNN is for, uh, for grid, also the, for, the, uh, for the image, and uh, very efficient. And uh, RNN is have the memory. So for this uh, language or uh, this kind of uh, uh, natural uh, uh, speak, speech. And when you come to the video, you always have CNN first and then put RNN because RNN cannot handle this uh, uh, huge amount of data. And for deep belief network, it's most general one, but because you don't have the uh, internal nice structure of that. So it's general, but the performance is not that good. It can fit some special case, but if you have a, a speech, video, a image, or this natural language, you consider RNN, you don't consider this a deep belief network. Okay, so we have the supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And then there are a third type, it's called the reinforcement learning. And the reinforcement learning, the uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning is after you collect data, you do their homework and you don't interact with the outside. But for the reinforcement learning, you will take the action to the outside world and then you get a payoff. And after the payoff, you, you will learn and then try to improve yourself. And then this is a learning, learning process. The agent observes the environment, take action and get a reward. And after that, the, uh, the, the agent study, uh, study and then try to maximize its award in the long run. So basically, okay, typically it can be, classically it's, a, uh, it's a, taken by the MDP, or, uh, MDP process. So the, for the MDP, Markov decision one, so basically they have the uh, tulip, where S is a finite side of state. So how many states you have, and then, the transition probability from one state to t to the next time t is irrelevant to any state before t. So this is a kind of a mark of condition. What I'm doing now, uh, what I'm doing next is only consider my current situation, nothing related to my past. So this is a mark of one. And then um, A is a finite of action. I can take action of transmission this one, transmission that one. Uh, so this is action. 
and the P is a state transfer probability. So if I'm counting this state, I take this section, what is the probability I'm moving to the state of S prime? So this is a transition probability. And this is reward. If I'm taking this action and uh, taking this action, oh, this here should be A, I forgot this. Uh, take action, this state, then what is the immediate reward for that? So the objective function is uh, taking, this a uh, discounted factor of the future reward like this one. So we try to maximize this kind of payoff for that. So this is called a uh, uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, then the state, it looks like uh, this uh, kind of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, flip, uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, digital circuit one. So with a different input, I will have different payoff and so on. And uh, we have the policy, policy. And so basically, okay, policy is the agent behavior. It's a map from the state to action. So basically, okay, and uh, uh, if I'm in this state, what I need to do? So basically, this is look like a protocol. And if you, if you work for this kind of, uh, I mean, fire, uh, fire department, firefighter department, and then they have the protocol. Under this case, what I do? What under that case, what I do? This is called policy based. And the other one is a value function. So basically I'm quantifying this kind of my action and the state into a value function. And this value function represent that under this state and uh, uh, under this action, what is my payoff for that? So there are two types of choice for that. And the optimal policy basically say that, okay, um, this MD process will cut the different state and action into the different region, different region. And then, okay, within this, this region, I mean, in other words, in this, uh, the final optimal policy means within this condition, I will do this one. Within that condition, I will do this one. So this is just an experience, okay. We, uh, so basically, okay, under this condition, what is my back action? Under that one, what is the back action? Through this uh, interaction with the world, I will learn for that. So basically, this is uh, the last equation means, last equation means. So, and the, the, these regions are non-overlapping, okay. So this is, uh, and also non-linear, non-linear. So how could you learn it? And uh, the most power, uh, powerful classic one is called Q-learning. The so-called Q learning is that, okay, this is a, a discount factor. And every time I'm update this Q function, this is my immediate payoff. And uh, this is uh, my future payoff. So I'm trying to up take the action such that, okay, I'm updating not only my immediate payoff, but also my future payoff. And this is important, for example, okay, suppose we don't consider the future. Uh, so suppose tomorrow is the end of the day. Okay, do you, have, do you guys have any interest to listen to my talk? Yeah, no, I mean, you just enjoy, okay, to get the immediate payoff R, and that's it. But because you are considering the future, consider the future. So in this case, okay, uh, you take the action to maximize not only this uh, immediate payoff, I mean, I understand you guys suffering a lot, and then, but also you consider the future. The future, maybe you can publish some other papers here. So that's really okay, you, you, you listen to this one. Anyway, so this is a very, very kind of a brief overview of this kind of mathematical tools. And uh, next one, okay, maybe after the break. Okay, after the break, let's come back uh, in 10 minutes. And uh, then we talk about the different example for the RS80 the kind of uh, resource allocation to improve the cell phone network. And uh, uh, then uh, we talk about the RS uh, uh, Internet of Things for this uh, protocol. Okay, so any question? Okay, uh, welcome back. And uh, uh, let's talk about this kind of uh, RS applications. And uh, I think you most, most of you know that my background is a kind of resource application. So, but RIS uh, sounds look like a physical layer one. So in the next few, uh, next few examples, we show you that, okay, how the RIS will affect the network resource allocation problem. So package it into the RIS scenario. So, uh, give me one second. And uh, for RIS aided cellular network is a programmable propagation. So inherent analog 
beam forming. So basically, okay, by using direct pointing the uh, analog beam forming into a different direction, we are supposed to able to make the make this kind of a performance uh, in certain direction better. And then the propagation uh, environment is equal to the channel propagation, which I cannot control, uh, which is uh, basically okay related to this uh, 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 the environment. But uh, the one thing we can control is a reflection propagation, which can be controlled by the frequency response and the coefficient. Hold on a second, give me one second. Sorry for that. Okay, and then the scenario, we can use the micro cell extension. So <clears throat> in this, uh, I mean, uh, uh, popular density place, especially rich place, okay, nobody wants to put a base station at their backyard. So the signal is very poor. In this case, we need some kind of RIS to extend it. And also we can have the distributed deployment and uh, replace the distributed antenna at the lower cost and the distributed relay and also uh, active RS for energy harvesting. We can also do the energy harvesting by pointing to the certain direction for the energy harvesting to gather the information. And uh, the goal and challenge is the uh, higher efficiency, higher capacity, larger coverage, and the challenge how to design the number of phase shift and how many bits is needed and how to deploy the RIS this kind of orientation and the location. What is the size of uh, uh, RIS influence, influence performance? How big you need? And uh, how to design RIS configuration, like the phase shift, how can you do the efficient algorithm to change it? And also, how can you coordinate multiple user access? Sometimes you have this kind of RIS good for one user, but you point to that direction, call the, call the interference in along the way. Then what do you need to do? Okay, so let's, have the several free case study. The first one is a limited phase shift effect. And this, uh, the title is a reconfigurable intelligence service assisted uh, communication with a, a limited phase shift. How many phase shifts are enough? As I mentioned, each component is a zero and a one, reflect or non-reflect. Adjacent one is also zero and a one and so on. So to combine together, it will have this kind of discrete, discrete kind of uh, value to change the direction. So this direction, this direction, this direction, this discrete is not a continuous one. So the key question is that uh, how many you need? Okay. And uh, the problem is that the initial work falls uh, on the phase shift optimization. They typically have the performance limitation of RS, RIS. It's worth to study the impact of limited phase shift because in practice, okay, it's the case. Typically, uh, most of the paper assumption is that, okay, it's a continuous one. But we want to say, okay, how many, how many discrete one is sufficient? So this gives this, uh, um, this uh, design, design, uh, design engineering a kind of uh, guidance on how many kind of component bit we need to put together. And the contribution is that we provide the analysis on the achievable data rate with a continuous phase shift on RSS and also discuss how the limited phase is uh, affected. So here we consider the uplink case and no uh, line of sight between the base station and the user. And then we have the RIS reflect the signal with the size of n times n. And then we have the k-bit quantized. And this is reflector, reflector this one. And this uh, phase shift is k-bit quantized. And then we have the line of sight channel and non-line of sight channel. And uh, then for this uh, uh, line of sight channel, we have this user to RIS and the RS to a uh, base station, base station, this type and this type. And for non line side, we have the overall path lost plus the kind of really fading. So this is a line of sight one, and this is a, uh, the phase is changing by this RS, uh, by, uh, by the distance and also by the RS. And uh, for non line of sight, it's this kind of signal bounce, bounce by the scatter around and then come back. And uh, so the all this power is co controlled by the path loss from this uh, user to RIS and from the RIS to the, to the base station. And then there's a, a complex Gaussian really feeding. And then the receive signal, this is the signal power. 
And the signal signal to noise ratio can be represented in this way. And then the data rate according to this uh, uh, Gaussian uh, channel capacity, and this is a case. And then this is the overall achievable rate. So pay attention to this uh, kind of problem formulation because uh, the channel model is different and you have to write it in a correct way, okay. And uh, then we, have, we quanti quantify the phase. It's a continuous phase and a discrete phase. And uh, this because we have the K bit, so basically the quantification error is uniformly distributed within this region because you have K bit. And then we do this uniform distribution over this uh, kind of uh, expected uh, uniform distribution and do the expectation, we get uh, this form. And then we, guarantee, we try to guarantee the performance. So basically for the ideal case, and this is quantified case, and then there's a threshold, there's a performance gap. We define this quantified as a threshold. And then we require the phase shift within this one, how much we need, we get a closed form solution. So here we show that, okay, this is a, a ideal case. And uh, then, okay, with a number of antenna increase, with a number of antenna increase, if you more, have more kind of, uh, I mean, uh, antenna, then the number of quantization can be smaller. So just with a two or three bit, you can achieve this kind of 90% of the performance. So in other words, okay, uh, because of multiple antenna there, you don't need to have uh, too many quantification. And uh, then the performance, uh, uh, will, will improve a lot. But if you only have one bit, sorry, okay, your performance might not be that good. Two or three bits is sufficient enough. And uh, then, okay, on the right hand side is the location of the RIS where you should locate it and then the performance. Okay. So here is a, a brief summary. So RIS assisted uplink uh, a cellular network and uh, we can derive the achievable rate, obtain the required quantization bit. And uh, for, for this uh, pure uh, line of sight, the asymptotic SNR of the square root RS, uh, anyway, so here, this is a channel for this, uh, I mean, uh, line of sight and really, and then there's uh, some behavior perform, uh, remark, and also, okay, for the phase shift, they just need a few bit to, to, uh, to achieve this. Two phase bit, two phase bit is almost uh, sufficient two-phase bit. If your antenna size is more than 300, you see the two-phase bit is good enough. Okay, so this is the first first uh, first one. And the second case study is the RIS, uh, uh, RIS assisted wireless coverage extension. So basically, okay, we want to have the, uh, the RIS orientation and the location optimization. So the problem is that RIS is capable of shaping the propagation environment because it's just reflection, okay. You remember in London, there's a building. After, after it's a beautiful building, after the build, okay, everybody complain because it's glass. And then it's a kind of a reflect, this kind of a light on the ground. So in the underground, a lot of car got burned or something like that, and the people get burned. So this is a kind of a similar story to RIS. So, the existing work only considers this performance given the location. So we want to discuss where should we should put the RIS and what orientation, such as uh, maximize the uh, cell coverage. So the contribution is derived from cell coverage for RIS assisted uh, a network uh, with a one base station and one user equipment and then maximize uh, this, uh, um, this RIS by uh, the cell coverage by optimizing the RS orientation and the horizontal distance. So here we have our downlink scenario, and then we have the RS, we have direct link, unlike the other, we have a line of sight and the, and, and the reflection one. So <clears throat> the channel model is with a direct link and there's a multipass, very strong multipass, okay. And then we only consider path loss evaluated to average performance. So this is direct link, and uh, this is reflection, and uh, then this is a, a reflection factor. So here we have, a, I mean, the cell coverage defined as the area where the received signal to noise ratio is greater than a certain threshold. So this is a, within this region, the signal to noise ratio greater than a certain threshold. So we have the region one, and then region two, <coughs> which is the RIS. And because the RIS kind of reflection, there's a big multipass. So basically increase the signal to noise ratio as a receiver. So this part is a region two. And then 
we want to maximize the overall region, the size of the region under two variables. One is the horizontal distance between this one. It's the second one is the theta. This, uh, this, is, this is kind of RS kind of reflection. So in other words, okay, uh, when I take a photographer, how far away this guy should hold the reflector and which orientation it should hold so that I look, I mean, much younger. Okay, anyway, just joking. Okay, so this is basically control, okay. And uh, then the RS or, uh, orientation optimization, this is a phase. And uh, then, okay, location basically can be calculated in this way. And then this can be solved by optimization problem, and then can be solved by interior point method, which I just mentioned before. It's a nonlinear function. And here we show you this result. This is RS orientation, and this is overall performance. This is theoretical and simulated result match very well. And then here is the horizontal distance, and here is the cell or self coverage, and there's an optimal solution there to to, uh, to do the coverage. So basically, okay, this is a kind of simulation result to show the, that, okay, our, our optimization can find where should we put this kind of uh, reflector. And that is interesting, okay. The self, uh, the cell phone coverage is definitely a big, comp a big kind of business. And uh, 2000, I mean, when I decided to quit my PhD first time, and uh, I found that because at that time, uh, there's a big kind of, uh, uh, internet bubble, okay. Uh, within one, one month, I found six jobs. One of the job is to find the, the black box spot on this kind of uh, coverage area so that they can put a small spot station or some kind of reflector there to improve this performance. So here, okay, the similar story, okay. And here is a brief summary. And the RS assisted downlink uh, cell, uh, cell phone network it derives the cell phone coverage, formulates the coverage extension problem, and the proposed algorithm to uh, obtain the RS placement solution. And the remark that if the RS should be deployed vertical to the direction from the basin to the RS, and should be uh, placed RS close to either the base station or the user equipment. Anyway, here, here there are some kind of theoretical guidance for that. Okay, and the third topic uh, we want to show is the RS, uh, it is a MIMO system. So we have the hybrid beamforming for RIS and uh, based uh, multi-user communication. We want to see this uh, kind of achievable rate. So the problem is that, okay, we have RIS, we have multiple user, and uh, the, we have the inter-user inter interference. And uh, we have limited discrete case. So how to design the size of RIS to perform beamforming? The challenge is that, okay, the Channel propagation RIS configuration are coupled. So, uh, and the discrete uh, electrical magnetic response render the sum rate by, to be a mixed integral programming problem. So basically, okay, uh, yeah. So here we have a downlink with a multiple user. And then we have this uh, MIMO with a base station, which can be uh, digital beamforming this one. And then we have a RIS analog beamforming to this different user. And then also we have a B, uh, B bit per reprogrammable for RIS. And then we have two hop relay. So basically, okay, the incident wave goes through two paths sequentially. It's a one uh, through this kind of obstacle here, the other is through this one. And uh, then we have the rising channel. And uh, for each user, we have the rising channel basically, okay, it's equal to the reflection propagation or can be controlled by the frequency and the re reflector. So we have the line of sight and non-line of sight. And the non-line of sight is basically scattering around and line of sight is basically controlled by the beam forming here in the base station as well as the RIS control here. So the key question is that, okay, how could we jointly kind of uh, control the digital beamforming in the base station and the non-analog kind of beamforming, so-called analog beamforming into the RIS, such as the, to serve the multiple user. So this is a uh, overall problem formulation. And then we have the hybrid beamforming. And uh, for analog, we have the analog beamforming, different selection of the phase shift. And for base station, it's a classical kind of uh, uh, digital beamforming. 
And for beam former and uh, for digital one, we try to beam toward the different, we have to beam toward the different part of the RF to, to reflect. And then this coupled and uh, for the three shift. So the co-channel interference, because of I have multiple users, so the things is a coupled. So my signal to no threshold will depend. I mean, unlike the uncoupled one, we don't have the self-interference. Here we have self-interference on the denominator of the signal to noise ratio. So it makes the things nonlinear, non-convex. And uh, moreover, moreover, this uh, shift is a kind of, uh, I mean, uh, this phase shift is also kind of dis uh, destroyed. I mean, basically, okay, uh, discrete. So, and also, okay, we want to, we want to see that, okay, even though it's coupled and we want to decouple the solution, such as, okay, we try to solve this kind of a digital beam forming first and then analog beam forming and then iteratively to, to converge to the solution. And uh, for this uh, digital beam forming, we use a zero, four beam for, a zero beam forming and because the overall power is a kind of controlled and obviously the solution is a water filling solution. Okay, basically, okay, it's a water filling solution. The analog beam forming, okay, the maximum the sum rate, the power should be maximum and analog beam is only related to the following constraint. So this is the following constraint. So we use a semi-definite programming problem, try to maximize this analog beam forming. And then, okay, we, uh, we try to do this kind of uh, iterative solution to do that one. And also we have to select where the RIS is it. And this one is the integral part. So here we become an integral programming, integral, mixed integral, uh, semi-definite programming problem. And then we use a branch and a bound method to decouple it, the integral part and the continuous part. And then uh, for continuous part, we further decouple into the digital beamforming part and the uh, analog beamforming part. And finally, we can find a feasible and uh, optimal solution. Not optimal, uh, near optimal, okay. And uh, then uh, how many antenna we request? And for RIS, we do some kind of, uh, I mean, uh, request, and we have some theorem, and to show that, okay, what is this uh, uh, fully digital, uh, to the requirement for RIS and the uh, digital film format, what is the relationship for this? And uh, here we show you this uh, kind of performance, and uh, this is size of RIS, when it uh, become larger, the performance become better, but it's saturated very quick, and the uh, proposed algorithm will outperform the uh, performance in the literature. And uh, there's a number of quantization bits. You can see, okay, two or three is sufficient enough. Anyway, so basically, okay, this is a, a result. And here the summary. Okay, we have this uh, kind of a hybrid informing on the base station because it's powerful and uh, you can have the traditional digital beamforming. For RS, we do the analog beamforming. And then how could we combine this uh, transmitter beamforming, RS uh, analog beamforming together to maximize multiple user performance and uh, considering the interference, considering how the RS is allocated for the different user. So this is a very interesting problem. And then uh, there are three remarks. The sum rate increased rapidly, and, uh, but uh, okay, we are saturated very quick. And um, also, okay, the sum rate increase with the size of RS convert to a stable point require antenna is only half of the traditional hybrid. So uh, traditional hybrid, uh, this one. So basically, okay, because of the, this one, and uh, we show that we saw RS, of, uh, RS kind of aided, so the base station can reduce their kind of number antenna to so reduce the cost. Or with the same number of antenna, the performance can be improved. So that is uh, for this uh, contribution. Okay, and uh, uh, the next one, the fourth one is a reconfigurable surface aided device to device communication. So D2D basically, okay, is uh, instead of communicating, if I want to call my neighbor, and uh, current standard is that, okay, I, my phone will connect to the base station far away and the base station far away connect to my neighbor, which is just next to me. So what I can do is that, okay, I can, I mean, bypass the base station and directly com communicate with my neighbor so that we can reduce the power and uh, also save half of the channel. But we need to be careful about the interference. So here, what do we do? Sorry, okay. 
what we do is uh, if I told the utilize RIS to alleviate the interference in D2D communication due to its capacity or beamforming. We formulate the system a sum rate maximization problem by optimizing the transmission power and the phase shift of RIS. We design an iterative algorithm to solve it. So here is a kind of a, I mean, problem formulation. We have an uplink RIS aided heterogeneous network. We have a one cell phone user, one cell phone user which connected here. And then we have the multiple D2D user, multiple D2D user. And they share the same pattern. So without RIS, this, this D2D communication, because they use the same frequency about the cell phone user, they will interfere with it. So with the RIS, could we do some kind of smart things? We guided this kind of cell phone, uh, cell phone user's kind of uh, signal towards the base station, well limit the interference with D2D on the, and the vice versa. So this is a key question. So this is a D2D re receiver and the base station receiver, and this is a data rate, data rate with a uh, RIS, which is a similar problem formulation as before. And then we try to add it at the sum rate of a D2D user and uh, this kind of um, cell phone user together. Where, uh, yeah, under the different kind of constraint. And then we can de decompose the problem, maximize the data rate with a power constraint and the phase shift. We do the decoupling. And uh, then, okay, we do the power, uh, for the power of uh, allocation sub problem. And uh, we reformulate this one with a Taylor expansion. And because the problem itself becomes non convex then what we do is that, okay, we use the first order Taylor expansion to become a convex optimization problem and then find the power. And in the next one, starting from next point to do the Taylor expansion and intuitively we get the solution. And then phase shift optimization is a discrete phase shift. And uh, so basically we use another algorithm to find the, the other sub problem. And here we show the result. This is the number of D2D link. This is the sum rate. And then the proposed algorithm can be performed better than the other without the RIS or the other algorithm. And here the sum rate, here the number of antenna for RIS, and we can show that the proposed algorithm will also increase with the number of uh, RIS antenna. So basically, okay, what, I, this, what does this mean? This means this RIS can do the cleaning for the interference because it can do the beamforming towards the base station and then now in this kind of, uh, I mean, D2D kind of, D2D direction or the interference in direction. So this is a very nice designed kind of mirror such as, okay, the interference uh, environment becomes alleviated. So this is a basic key idea here. Okay, so not only I can improve this uh, performance of, uh, I mean, this signal to noise ratio, but I can also clean up the garbage for the interference. So this is a key idea for that. This is an advantage. And uh, so here, uh, the summary, uh, we propose a D2D communication with RIS, we formulate the problem formulation, and also we proper phase design, we can, we can efficiently clean up this uh, communication. So this is, you see that, okay. We are not talking about the uh, RIS kind of, uh, we are extending the RIS kind of uh, from this uh, just a performance analysis to many different resource allocation problems. Anyway, so the next topic is this uh, uh, reconfigure RIS assisted Mac for 6G. So 6G, okay. So and, uh, the problem is that most of the existing paper focus on this physical layer, I mean, it's a capacity. But how about the Mac layer? Yeah, you know, for Mac layer, this CSMA, this is kind of collision avoidance or this type of things. What is the impact to this, to this one? So the contribution is that, okay, um, we propose the RIS assisted MAC protocol to reserve to avoid the collision of R, in the RIS set. We solve the system sum rate of optimization by the transmission, bandwidth, and reflection. So here is the RIS. We have the multiple user want to talk with the base station. And then, okay, we have a uplink case and uh, then uh, we have the single antenna assumption, and then, okay, the RS can adjust it. So basically this is a received signal about the combination. 
The problem is that if everybody wants to talk to the base station because they are sharing the same, they will collide with each other, just like Wi-Fi. Okay, if there are too many users there, they will just collide with each other. So in this case, what you can do? And here, uh, we use the RIS assisted uh, mic protocol. At the first time, we have a reservation. So basically, we have this E request to send and E request uh, certified to send protocol to make a reservation. So at the beginning, you, you try to send a very short package to tell the access point, okay, I mean, I want to talk with you. And then the, the access point reply, okay, I want to talk with you, user, user one. Then it's because of broadcast nature, the user, uh, user one will transmit. In the later part, will the other ones stop, stop talking in, a, in, a, in the reservation slot. And after the reservation slot stop, it will start its negotiating period again. So basically, a similar idea to RTS and CTS. And then uh, for the resources, we have the three dimension. The first dimension is the time zone. So how could we reserve this information, uh, reserve the time for a specific user to do that? And second one is the power zone. How is the power control for that? And the third one is the RI zone. So RS component, which one I should uh, allocate for each user, which user? So basically, okay, you can see, okay, with RIS, the problem becomes a much more higher dimension optimization, okay. And then uh, this is the harm rate we want to have with a transmission constraint, RIS constraint, negotiation constraint, bandwidth constraint, and so on. So what you can do, and then you can also decouple the problem with this kind of a, a, a sub, sub problem and something like that. Anyway, so this is a standard kind of optimization. I can skip. And then here we show that the number of uh, uh, RS equipment increase, the overall signal to noise ratio increase, and uh, without RS, what is the case? And also the number of users we increase, we have this kind of uh, overall throughput going up and going down because it's a traffic jam type. <laughs> yeah, traffic, a traffic jam. And with too many users, it will jam. But uh, compared with uh, without RS, it will have the better performance. So basically, okay, here, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, RS assisted mic, basically, okay, beyond this kind of physical layer, we try to consider this um, um, random access one, and uh, not coordinated access, just random access. And then we formulate this kind of uh, sum rate maximization problem. And then the dimension for variable is uh, reserve the time, reserve this kind of uh, RS component and the power control. So basically the problem become high dimension one. And then the throughput can be improved and uh, something like that. So basically we are pushing the, this RS to a higher level from the physical layer to the mic layer. So this is a like another type. And then there are many different potential directions. So basically we saw why RS is very hot. It's, it's because it's not only the physical layer one. You basically every layer you can you can put into that and then you redo the original story, <laughs> and then it will have a different funding for that. So basically, the RS assists in the multi-cell uh, user coordination, or quantity radio, NOMA, and the MIMO, and then we have to do this uh, uh, channel estimation and modeling, and uh, so how can you estimate the channel? and other issue, adjoint coding, physical layer security, emergency, energy efficiency, and something like that. So you can see that, okay, recently, and uh, for RIS paper, you have to find in archive, okay, because so quick, okay. Anyway, so this is a five example. We show you, <laughs> we show you um, how to push the RIS into the other layer. Next, we will talk about uh, a real hardware implementation into the RIS Internet of Things for sensing and localization. So this is the most CPS story. So RIS aided the Internet of Things due to the capability of beamforming. RIS is uh, able to move the spatial, improve the spatial resolution because the antenna is an analog antenna. It's a so nice and a lot of component there. A lot of component means very good aperture, so it's very, the beam will be very narrow, so it can be uh, pinpoint to the location very accurately. So in this case, indoor localization can be, or even outdoor, it can be kind of very accurate. 
So RRS can be utilized to enhance the sensing and the localization accuracy. So this is uh, one of the hot topic. And RRS sensing uses the RRS signal to recognize the object or <coughs> monitoring parameter. So basically, it's a contactless leverage the existing communication infrastructure. So for example, this Xbox, Xbox Kinect, okay, it's basically use RF to see your gesture. So I mean, uh, uh, every day I'm just a kind of a just dance, okay, all, all this kind of dance, yeah. And uh, the, uh, the objective is to minimize the sensing error. <clears throat> the challenge is to recognize the objective monitor to the uh, receive the RF signal and the uh, customer propagation environment and the multi-objective re recognition. Those are the challenges. And uh, there are there are many other applications. For example, uh, the the security system and they can detect okay the window is open or not, and uh, also okay they can you know uh, for American. American is not people for old old man. Okay, a lot of old men uh, die alone at home because they're falling down. After falling down, they cannot reach their phone, and uh, then okay, uh, they, they they just pass away in that in that way. So that's reason. Okay, a lot a lot of research is doing this kind of uh, uh, falling estimation for senior person, and uh, <coughs> this kind of RS aided uh, sensing. Is a kind of a very good uh, uh, potential solution. Oh, by the way, okay, if you're listening, could you please mute because there are some background noise. Okay, thank you. And uh, okay, and uh, RSI localization, they have the criteria measurement, this time of arrival, phase of arrival, receive signal RSS, and the reference channel, I mean, reference signal can be geographic or relative. The objective is to maximize the localization accuracy. The challenge is to enhance the difference between the two adjacent positions and the proper phase shift design for RS. And it's a real-time implementation want to have the low complexity recovery algorithm for observation. So here is um, another work, RIS based uh, RF sensing, design optimization and implementation. So RF sensing is a receive recognize the influence of the sensing target on the wireless signal uh, propagation. And uh, there's no contact with the sensing target. They have limited the complicated, uh, uh, limited, but it's limited by the complex var var uh, wireless uh, uh, environment. And the RF based RF signal can, uh, can get the, uh, this kind of uh, uh, human, uh, human poster recognition and uh, recognize different human, uh, human automatically. The challenge is uh, um, RIS design. Uh, you need a large number of RIS and uh, for different state for different element. And uh, sometimes, okay, the decision, everything is coupled. So this is a kind of challenge. And here we have the uh, model description. We have the transmitter and the direction antenna, which is a point towards the RIS. And the receiver is the only direction uh, vertical antenna that uh, around the RF. The human is a, a space reflection vector carry the information of the gesture. So try to see what gesture I have. And the RF element in the same group are uh, in the same state. And then, okay, so the channel modeling is a multi-pass component, uh, environment scattering. Around my house, there are some kind of scattering. Line of sight from the transmitter to receiver and the reflection dominant from the transmitter to RIS, RIS point a beam to me, to human and the human reflection it to the receiver. So transmitter to RIS, RIS beam to me and then reflect to the receiver. And then we do the recognition period. So contain K frame during which the human posture is fixed. And then receive the signal using the recognized period I use for recognition. And then we have the frame configuration. We have a different state corresponding to the phase shift. And each group of RIS sequentially changes the state and uh, so basically the screen and the config field the, by the duration of each group staying in the AN state. So this is design details. And the decision function. So the receiver uses a decision function to generate the probability of deciding the different human gesture. So here we try to minimize this uh, forced recognition cost. 
which is determined by the frame configuration and decision function. And uh, then here, this, uh, this uh, probability is a probability of gesture, cause for recognition, plus, and the measurement signal in a period, and the probability decision of, the, of this one. And then, okay, to minimize this cost, we also do the decoupling into the frame recognition optimization and the decision rule optimization. So we decouple the problem into two. And for frame recognition optimization, the objective is uh, on the compressed sensing technique, minimize the mutual co uh, coherent measurement matrix improvement sensing accuracy. Thus, increase the recognition cost and the average mutual coherent of the measure measurement matrix for space block is minimized. And the method uh, we use is a uh, frame configuration alternative optimization. So alternative minimize the K-frame co configuration, and uh, then we use the uh, ADM uh, augment log number method to optimize the solution. And for decision optimization, the, the other sub-problem, the objective is a reconfigurable cost given the optimization frame configuration. So we use a uh, supervised learning algorithm to train it. And here is the implementation. We have uh, the RS of uh, 60 by 60 times of, uh, 52 centimeters square. And uh, then, okay, we have the diagonal subject. Uh, this is a brand. And uh, we have this kind of uh, PN diagonal. And total number of phases is eight. And then we show three. Three bit is good enough. RS controller, we use IPGA. And we use, uh, I mean, the transceiver, we use US, uh, USRP. And uh, then other, we have the low noise amplifier, signal synchronizer. Ethernet, uh, Ethernet Connect switch and the personal computer with GPU package. And here is a student in Beijing University. And then they only have a try to test uh, in front of this RS, they try to test, uh, you see the RS here. And then they try to test full gesture, standing, sitting, bending, and laying down. And uh, then, okay, this is the experiment result. Then, the average mutual co uh, co coherent of the measurement matrix is reduced. So, uh, okay. And uh, the optimized average mutual coherent decrease with the number of group that RS is contained. And the optimal average mutual coherent increase with the size of group. Okay, so I just read it, but uh, I don't quite understand. And uh, also, okay, we compare with the traditional RS sensing and uh, RS increased the poster recognition by 23%. And the compared with the random frame configuration, they, they achieve 14.6% uh, higher uh, improvement. So here is this kind of a summary. And uh, we have the RS based uh, I mean poster recognition. They propo we propose a, a periodic configuring protocol, we formulate the force recognition cost minimization protocol, and we propose the algorithm to solve it and also decouple the problem. One part we use the algorithm, uh, FEO algorithm, the other we use the supervised learning. And then by using this RIS, we can find that, okay, we can improve the uh, accuracy and by 14 or 23 percent. And uh, this is the first protocol. The second protocol is towards ubiquitous positioning by leveraging RIS. So the RIS as based positioning uh, obtained by this uh, uh, RIS as, and store the RIS of distribution for indoor environment and uh, very easy to implement. And uh, uh, I think uh, um, one of the very, uh, very kind of uh, Important paper is the localization. Uh, I forgot by Liu Yunhao. Okay, anyway, that, that paper gives a lot of kind of details on this one. And uh, here we try to uh, use the RIS aided RSS based multi user positioning. The user receives a signal from the AP and RIS. RIS adjusts a, a, a RSS distribution by changing its configuration. So, and then so that, okay, the position will be better. So the challenge is the RS configuration design. There's a <coughs> large number of RS configuration. And there is complicated coupled relationship between the RS configuration and the RSS distribution. So here the story is that, okay, if I have a surface there, 
for indoor indoor localization using RSS because it's a multi-path or something like that, and uh, then okay, it's a chaotic and the accuracy the accuracy is not very good. But if using the RSS, could we clean up this indoor kind of chaotic multi-path environment such as RSS based algorithm can be much more accuracy. So this is a basic uh, key idea for that. And then uh, we have the position uh, a size point sending a signal to RIS and the mobile user. And we have RIS and the user basically uh, measures this uh, RSS for positioning. And uh, we have the space of interest for discrete n block. So we discretize this one into n block. And for RIS, okay, we, have, we can trace a multiple user. We have the M element, and then each element with a different reflection component. So by control this kind of phase, how could we clean up this kind of inside of the room, this kind of uh, uh, RSS environment? And uh, for RSS model, we have the direct line of sight channel from access point to user, and uh, we have reflection channel from this access point to element and to the user and with, uh, with, to the nth block. And then this is basically okay. Basically, kind of a channel model. This is RS as an nth block, and so on. And then we try to have the position protocol. The position protocol has a k cycle, and each circle contains four steps. We optimize the AP select the optimal configuration for CK for this one. Then we broadcast to the user at RS. Then the measurement, the AP sends a single tone frequency. The user records the RS under this one. And the response, and the user send the RSS information to the to the AP. So basically, this is a four step, and then this is a, a AP send a signal RSS a kind of a configuration to clean up the, the things, and then the user send back the location. And the objective is to minimize the average position lost. And so this is in each circle. We try to uh, we try to minimize this uh, cost function. Or this is a, I mean, prior information user as an ice block, and R is a path loss. So this is a joint, this is a probability that, uh, I mean, this is a kind of conditional probability, and this is decision. So here, basically, originally, because this environment is very poor, so basically, okay, this one will be coupled, and the performance will be bad. But by using this RSS, sorry, by using RIS, this coupled this kind of thing will become more kind of a zero and a one kind of case. So this this one will become better. So it's, and then okay, the so overall this cost will be shrink. Yeah. And uh, so we can have a configuration optimization algorithm. Initial find the different location of minimization configuration and the alternative method method. And we, we have global search, basically search for different direction, different location, and then we use a CBA descendant method. And this is a complexity. So basically at the beginning, we need to screen all this kind of a different location, and then different kind of portability, so that okay, the RIS know that okay. Under this case, if there are people in this location or that location, I need to kind of, uh, kind of uh, clean in this way. Okay, this pattern. So, a lot of training, okay, for this one. But uh, after the training, the world becomes so clear, okay. And then you can see, okay, this is the number of circle, and uh, this kind of uh, propagate position arrow will shrink, shrink a lot. And then, okay, we see this kind, kind of uh, uh, number of cycle increase, this position arrow will reduce a lot. So here, this uh, RS based one, we propose a kind of a positional protocol. We formulate the average positional minimization problem. And then we propose an algorithm to, to, to tell that, okay, how could we optimize the RS for, for my uh, kind of, uh, I mean, RS kind of uh, 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 sighting. And then the position error obtained by the proposal is much lower than the benchmark. And the position error increased when the standard deviation increased and the number of cycles increase. Anyway, so this is, uh, I mean, the last protocol, uh, uh, this is the second, uh, second prototype that uh, they implemented. And uh, then we have the potential direction. 
the convergence uh, with the communication, we have the coexistence with the cognitive radio, cooperation, and the co-design for the different purpose. We have signal processing, consider mobility and Doppler resolution, angle, angular resolution, and the non-uniform illu illumination. And there are some other things like uh, context aware, security, energy efficient, and so on. So here is the conclusion. Here is the conclusion. And uh, RIS is a promising solution for 6G, providing an uh, intelligent uh, paradigm to shape the environment. The key word, the shape the environment. Previously, all this propagation is not controlled by you. Now suddenly, okay, the environment can be controlled. Okay, then what a nice story, okay. So improve the spectrum efficiency, uh, extended the coverage, and the integrate, integrate image sensing and wireless communication. And then we explore the different aspects of related RIS native communication sensing and the positioning. And uh, so basically, okay. And uh, the limited phase effect, we discuss a different topic like the limited phase effect, RIS orientation, hybrid beam forming, sensing, and the positioning. So the first, first three is related to resource, resource allocation, the last two is a kind of prototype for that. And here is a related publication. And uh, we put it here. And uh, finally, as yesterday, okay, and uh, our group is uh, doing everything but the research, okay. So, I mean, uh, if you have an uh, opportunity to join us, either as a PhD student or this kind of PhD team, uh, you are quite welcome after the COVID-19, okay. Now, okay, nobody in the school, everybody at home. But I hope this will be passed very quick and uh, let's uh, find the opportunity to play together. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Han, yeah, thank you very much. Uh -huh. Let me stop recording uh, and then